there's a story about a little boy who came running up to his father one day and he boasted, he said, Daddy, I'm a big boy now, will you take the training wheels off my bike? And immediately his father, without any comment, took the training wheels off the bike. The little boy hopped on it and he proceeded to fall down. After scraping both knees and elbows, the father went over and asked his son if he needed some help. And the father took time to guide the bike until the little boy learned how to balance himself and learn how to ride. With a little bit of sanctified imagination, we can well today see that that could be the story of St. Paul. Time after time, Paul fell down, but when he began trusting in God and his Heavenly Father to guide him, he learned that he could balance life and he could move forward. It's little wonder that St. Paul exclaimed to the Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Last week, I had an opportunity to stand in the Red River Meeting House over in Logan County, Kentucky. Red River Meeting House is a place that exemplifies the spirit of trust in God. Reverend James McGreedy became pastor of that church back in 1796. However, before coming to Kentucky, he was run out of North Carolina by a letter that was written in blood that said, if you don't quit preaching, we're going to end your life. And when he came to Kentucky, he had both knees and elbows scraped. And he found Kentucky ready for a revival and an awakening. And he and his congregation began praying, and in 1800 that revival came. The guidance from God came, and the frontier was awakened to the grace of God. The Cumberland Presbyterian Church, of which I am a part, came out of that great revival because one man would not allow his troubles or his defeats to put an end to him. America has oftentimes been down with both knees and elbows scraped. However, she's always found that inner strength and she's always had an upper, upward trust in God and she's moved forward to awaken the world to the ring of freedom. We stand today on the threshold of tomorrow. We who are America here today can accomplish great things if we will trust our Heavenly Father to guide. We are one nation under God. Therefore, let us look to the hills from whence cometh our help. Let us pray. Almighty God, ruler of all people, direct those who make, administer, and judge our laws, the President of the United States, and others among us, especially Vice President George Bush, that led by your wisdom they may lead us in the way of righteousness. Remind each of us when we stumble and fall to lace up the bootstraps of our hearts and trust your heavenly direction as we march forward in the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you please rise for the playing of our national anthem and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. the flag, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, 
with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Trumpet soloist Brian Owen and David Logan will feature as the Kentucky Colonel Marching Band plays Fire Dance. Kentucky Colonel Band is directed by uh, Paul Blackburn, but how about a nice hand for Field Commander Beth Hughes for the job she did, and for Brian and David for their work. You think it was loud out there. How'd you like to be sitting up here? I'd like to introduce uh, some other folks who are on the platform with me. Uh, most of whom you already know. Uh, may I introduce Cindy Jenkins, who is a senior this year, but was junior class president last year. Cindy, stand up, please. <laughs> junior Leslie McKinney was sophomore class president in 1983-84. Sophomore Ellen Rushing was freshman class president 1983-84, Ellen. I'm gonna skip Amy for just a second. Doug Rainey last year was the president of the eighth grade and he is a freshman this year. Doug, stand please. about one and a half minutes away. 
And this is what's known in our business as stretch. I just looked out the door and I saw the motorcade arrive, so that's the reason I know. Let me introduce to you uh, one of your fellow students who will have the distinct honor of introducing the vice president, Amy Grimes, who is this year's student body president. Amy, stand, please. Honored guests, faculty, students, and friends, Lone Oak is indeed it is indeed fortunate to be on the itinerary of our distinguished speaker. If you visit the halls of government in Washington, D.C., it is very thrilling to see a national official. However, to have the Vice President, President of the United States choose to visit our house is an honor without equal. For us to be able to claim Mr. Bush as one of our own and maybe add to his credentials, we would like to make him an honorary graduate of Bonnell High School. Vice President, on behalf of all of Lone Oak, we would like to bestow upon you the degree of Distinguished Honorary Graduate of Lone Oak High School. Why, thank you. <laughs> One more thing. A little more. Right. Also, we would like to present to Mr. and Mrs. Bush two Lone Oak letter jackets. the Vice President of the United States. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Amy. Well done. Spectacular. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. You think Amy was nervous? How about me coming here to this, getting a honorary citizenship of this school. I'm not sure I could pass the courses that some of you are involved in these days, all this computer stuff. But let me just say I am delighted to be here. And what I want to do is try to be as responsive as possible to your questions. It's great, this city among all, with the great heritage of Alvin Barkley, I certainly knows something about vice presidents. I think he was the one that, or his grandkids that invented the term Veep that is stuck with every Vice President of the United States since then. And I am just delighted to be here. We, as we drove in, some of the grade schools were out there. Mr. Brown telling me that they were part of his, his uh, superintendency, if there's such a word. And I'm very pleased to be here with Mr. Adams and Mr. Stewart and everybody else who are, who are uh, uh, making our visit so good. Let me say this, that before I answer your questions, I'm going to give you a little taste of national politics. Uh, I want to just mention two specific issues to you, and you don't have to answer your, ask those questions on that. You can ask them on, on anything you want. But the first one has to do with our opponents' charges on taxes and on spending. And I want to just make a little statement on that, and then the next one I want to just say a word on a subject that I know concerns all of you and just tell you from the heart our position on arms reductions. You know, in the primary and caucus drives to secure his nomination, uh, our opponent, uh, Vice President Mondale, made an incredible number of promises to a lot of the special interest groups in the country. And the cost of those promises has been subject to a wide array of interpretations. Well, why the financial cost is out in the open, what has been kept uh, a secret is how the Vice President, how Mr. Mondale, if elected, intends to pay off the political promises that he's made. And during last month's convention, the Democratic Convention, he told us what we already knew, that if he becomes President, he got right up, looked into the television and said, I will increase your taxes. Now since then, he has avoided 
telling the American people in forums like this or anyway how much or how he will raise those taxes. Now the secret's out because yesterday our Treasury Secretary, Donald Reagan, did the American people a great service by revealing how much the Mondale campaign promises will cost every American family. And the figure really is a staggering figure. The Mondale tax bill isn't just to add $100 or $200 to your parents' taxes or to some in the audiences, or even 1000 It would range from $1,890 per household to $3,350 per household by 1989. That's in new taxes, and that's each and every year. So he knows that he'll increase your taxes by that amount, we believe, and now the American people know it because of this detailed analysis the Secretary put out yesterday. You can expect that in the next few days, Vice President Monday will apologize for this plan by telling the American people that only the rich will pay for these promises. The fact is that working men and women, middle-income Americans, will pay directly in higher taxes. And even more significant is that these enormous tax increases will bring the economic recovery that this country is enjoying. So we're in a strong recovery now, and these taxes will bring that recovery to a screeching halt. Certainly, it would trigger a new recession, uh, increasing the roles of the unemployed, eliminating opportunity, and bringing the curtain down on the period of sustained economic growth that everybody in the country wants. And finally, I think that we have to give Mr. Mondale some credit, be somewhat understanding. He put together a coalition in the primary days of democratic special interests that allowed him to overcome severe adversity in the early primaries. You remember at first there were eight challengers for the democratic primary, then five, then three. But he overcame those challenges. Uh, and he, one of them was, of course, Gary Hart's early victory in, in New Hampshire. But because of the political coalitions that make up the muscle and the sinew of the Democratic Party, the National Democratic Party, and I'm thinking of the AFL-CIO and the NEA and the NOW and other groups, he was able to pull out of his tailspin and, to his credit, got the nomination. But the American people should not be asked to pay for those those success, the success of the candidate in securing that primary nomination, shouldn't be asked to pay for party politics. And that's what I think Mr. Mondale is asking the country to do. So in the next days ahead, I think you're going to see a very lively debate now as he tries to spell out how he's going to go about raising everybody's taxes, having already been on the record for an enormous amount of spending increases. On the other subject I mentioned, let me simply say this. This president, our president is committed not to what some call a freeze, where you just stop deployment of nuclear weapons or stop development of them, but we are committed to significant reductions in nuclear weapons. We want, a limitation, we want an arms agreements that will reduce, not limit the growth. We want arms agreements in intermediate nuclear force, these are these intermediate range missiles, or in these strategic missiles, the ones that go intercontinental, we want agreements that will significantly reduce the weapons and will do it in a way where everybody knows that the other guy's keeping his word of honor. That's what they call verifiability. And incidentally, I was sent by the president to Geneva and I was asked to put on the table in Geneva a treaty to ban all chemical weapons, ban them from the face of the earth. And we're still there waiting for the Soviets to negotiate. So I wanted you to know, and I say this because I think a lot of young people are concerned about nuclear war and peace and all of that kind of thing. Because our president has strengthened the military and because he has stayed firm in his negotiation, not giving away a lot of significant systems before we even start to talk, because of that, I really honestly feel we are closer to peace and I feel we are in a better position now to, ne to negotiate these major arms reductions that I'm sure everybody in Paducah and certainly everybody in Washington and everybody across this country without regard to party wants. So these are two of the issues that are out there and with no further ado, I'll be glad to uh, respond to any questions that any of you have. I don't know whether procedures are set up, but uh, are you? All right. If you'll just follow me, Mr. Vice President. We're going down in the middle of the... Uh, oh, all right. Don't feel my jacket. 
My name is Jillianna Mobley. Mr. Vice President, our system of taxation is very confusing and complicated for taxpayers as well as the government. Um, what do you think about a flat tax system being enacted in this country? Well, right now the Treasury Department is studying that whole concept of tax simplification. And as the President said the other day, you're absolutely right. Those who go to fill out, he says, even Einstein might not have figured out how to fill out these darn tax, ret tax returns. One of the problems you run into on the so-called flat tax is that some of the things like deduction for interest of certain kinds of, uh, well, say mortgages is, is, is threatened. And that one, so then one group will say, well, you can't leave that one out. Uh, you have in certain incentives in the energy business like depletion and intangible drilling and somebody said, well, you can't leave that one out. So there's a lot to overcome, but I am convinced that we will be able to go for tax simplification whether it results in a flat tax per se with no exemptions, I wouldn't think it would do that. But it can be much more simple, and our administration is going to wait now till this Treasury study is finished, and hopefully we'll be able to simplify the tax returns in the whole tax system. One of the things that happens, incidentally, with the complexities is there's an esti estimates that a lot of revenues are lost to the government because of the complexities of the tax system, and then the inability of the government to audit everybody's tax turn. One of the nice things about being vice president is you get an audit every single year, whether you want it or not. But uh, I'm not sure it's so nice. But most people's tax returns are not audited. So simplification is what we want. Thank you very much. Yeah. Who's next? Yes, ma'am. My name is Lisa Deming. Mr. Vice President, quoting a recent statement of yours, you said, we have a major difference with Walter Mondale on defense spending and we have a major difference with him on how one negotiates. Would you please comment further on the differences you spoke of? Well, yes. On defense spending, we have felt that the prime responsibility of the president, he feels strongly, is the national security of the country. We came in and felt that we had to improve, for example, the Navy, that we had to go forward with to render less obsolete some of the systems that we've had in terms of strategic systems. I'm thinking of the MX and the B-1 bomber that was rolled out yesterday. So we are supporting those things, a large Navy, an MX, a B-1, and some other things. Now, Mr. Mondale has said that he wants to cut spending by $100 billion in this area over three years. He's talked about reducing it by 30 to 40 in this thing that, that, uh, that I mentioned up here, the program that Don Regan came forth. He says he, he wants to get rid of the MX. He wants to get rid of the B-1. We think that's bad. We think it's in our interest to have those things. And we also believe that in terms of negotiation for the real reductions that we want, you do not give away systems like that before you even sit down to negotiate. So we do have a big difference with him on it. He says he wants to keep a strong defense. He wants to do away with the nuclear carriers. We think that that's an important thing, or with the future nuclear carriers. So we have major difference with him in terms of, in terms of uh, defense. And his record in the Senate was not as strong on defense as, as certainly uh, the President and I feel, feel we need. So we do have a major difference. The other part was on what? Defense spending. Yeah. Well, these are the, you know, I think I've addressed that. And then the other one was on tax? The way one negotiates. Oh, the negotiation. Yeah. Well, there, you know, we need to get the message out a little better. Because I think for a while, it was, people were saying, well, Ronald Reagan doesn't want to negotiate. In fact, even last week, the Democrats were charging around, I say national Democrats, the more liberal ones, we're charging around saying to us, uh, well, the president isn't even willing to sit down with the Soviets. I would remind you that in three and a half years, there have been three Soviet leaders, Brezhnev, Andropov, and now Konstantin Chernyenko. And this is the first president who's had that kind of change, and indeed two of them very sick, and maybe a third one sick. And you have, Chernyenko has been in there relatively short time, not, not really long enough to consolidate his power. So the realism of negotiating is very, very difficult from these people that claim, well, I'll just jump on a plane and go negotiate. It takes two to negotiate. It's not us. It's not the United States of America that left the negotiating table on start strategic arms talks in Geneva. It's not the United States that left the negotiating table on, on uh, intermediate nuclear force. It's the Soviet Union. I'm the one 
the president asked to go to Geneva to put on the table, and I did, with the Soviet ambassador sitting three down there, I was put on the table a treaty to ban all chemical weapons, get rid of them all, and do it in a way so we know they're keeping their word and they know we're keeping their word. But they are not willing to negotiate seriously on that. So one side, I think, feels, well, let's have some concessions. Let's stop the MX. Let's stop the B1. Let's freeze. Let's see then if they'll negotiate. We don't think that's the way you deal with the Soviets. We don't think you deal from a weakened position, weakening our position in order to get them to talk. So we have a major difference on negotiation with our opponents in this election. But I think the good news is, I think the American people now see that the president has reached out to the Soviets in various ways, and we could discuss that if we have more time. And I think they know that he really wants arms reduction, but he wants it to be verifiable. Frankly, we're, we're, we're troubled when the other side doesn't keep its word on treaties. Who's next? Here we go. Incidentally, these are very, I might, I don't want to be gratuitous, but these are very good, very good questions. Shoot. Hello, my name is Denise Smith, and Mr. Vice President, when and if you do debate Ms. Ferraro, what do you think the main topics will be? Well, uh, I think the main topics will be the issues, broad ones, like we're talking about here, taxes and spending, the economy. You see, I believe that what's going to determine this election is the economy. Remember back in the debate when Ronald Reagan debated, uh, debated Jimmy Carter? And he asked the question, are you better off than you were four years ago? And I think that that's the question that we will answer this year. If they don't ask it, we will, because the American people are much better off as a whole. Not everybody, but as a whole. Inflation's down, interest is down, productivity is up, savings are up, employment in the auto business is up. There's a lot of good about our country, a lot of good things happening. And all we hear out of the other side is gloom and doom. So I think the economic issues will be the main one, and then war and peace, because I note that she has picked up Mr. Mondale's line that we're not interested in peace. And I think I know something about this. I've traveled to over 50, well, to 59 countries and met the leaders of many more of them since I've been vice president. And I think I understand the complexities of, of war and peace and the complexities of negotiation and the relationships that we have established and the strength of our alliance and all of that. So I think a lot of it would be on, on foreign policy. Last point, though. It's not the vice presidential level that determines elections. It's the presidential level. And so just as she is out attacking Ronald Reagan every day, as she did yesterday in Oregon and did the day before, I think it was California, over and over again, she's trying to keep her focus on the top of the ticket. Why? Because she knows, I'm sure, that that's what determines the election. And that's what I try to do. You notice up here, my points were about what Mr. Mondale's positions or the Carter-Mondale administration, which some people don't like, but you've got to have a department. Poor old Mondale looks like he never heard of Jimmy Carter. But, uh, but you've got to have a point of departure. You've got to have a point from which you're starting. And so, and so I think those will be the, I think it'll be top of the ticket and it'll be the broad brush issues that are that'll be debated all across this country and if there are debates and you know presidential or vice presidential that's where that's where it'll be and it always has been incidentally who else how about on this side here we go all right my name is Leanne Aiken and I'd like to address this question to Mrs. Bush that's great <laughs> sure. Mrs. Bush, as a woman, how do you feel about your husband running against the first woman vice presidential candidate in U.S. history? Good question. Uh, you, you see, as a woman, I don't think we ought to think of the candidate as a woman. I mean, we're talking about someone who might someday be the president of the United States, and I think we ought to think, is this person qualified to be president? Uh, that's a question the American people are going to have to answer. I do not think she's as well qualified to be president as my vice presidential candidate. But I, <laughs> let, let me just say one other thing. I thoroughly expect to vote for a woman for president someday, and she will be a Republican. Thank you. Here we go. My name is Michael Washington. Mr. Vice President, John Hinckley Jr. shot and almost killed President Reagan and Press Secretary James Brady. 
and also wounded two other policemen with a handgun. Robert Kennedy was shot and killed by a handgun. George Wallace was shot in the back with a handgun and is now paralyzed. Now can you explain why after acts of violence like these, the Reagan administration still opposes regulations on handgun ownership? Yeah, I can. And you're right, those things happen. But let me remind you that there are strict laws in the District of Columbia about registration of handguns. Let me remind you that in New York State, where you have, I think it's the Sullivan Laws or some real tough gun laws, it hasn't seemed to inhibit crime. We believe that people should have the right to defend themselves, and so we haven't been supporters of gun control per se. We don't think that's the answer. Our answer, and incidentally, crime in this country is going down, is to be tougher on the criminal and feel more concerned about the victims of crime. And we believe that's the answer to it, not, not gun registration, you see, or gun control. So I wish that idealistically that, that there was something we could do about it in the, along the lines you say, but it won't, I don't, in my view, it won't work. I think the reason crime is coming down is some of its demographic, but I think it is because we have a much tougher approach, not just at our level, but local law enforcement, we have strong belief in local law enforcement people and state law enforcement, and uh, the crime figures are getting better. We're waging, incidentally, this isn't exactly on your question, but the first time an all-out concerted federal effort to try to interdict narcotics from coming into this country, and we believe that's in the national interest. So there is a difference of approach on it, and I've given you our position. Thank you. Any others? Here goes one. Mr. Vice President, my name is David Thompson and my question concerns the Iraq-Iran war. Iran is anti-American because of the hostage ordeal. Iraq is pro-Russian. The United States now supports Saudi Arabia, which in turn militarily supports Iraq. The goal of the United States as of now is to keep the Persian Gulf open to commerce. How does the Reagan administration plan to keep the Gulf open without getting any more involved than it already is? We will support what's known as the GCC, the Gulf Coordinative Council which includes countries like Saudi Arabia and Oman and Bahrain and Qatar and the United Arab Emirates, that we do support them. And we think the president has said, look, it is in the free world's interest to keep those sea lanes open. Uh, Europe, not so much us, because we are far less dependent on foreign oil than when we came into office. But our friends in Europe would literally freeze a lot, I'm sure, if, if the Gulf was closed. They just couldn't get the energy required unless that Gulf stays open. So we feel it is in the interest not just of the United States, but of the Alliance to keep it open. We have no intention of sending troops or think matters of that nature. Where we have responded, we've responded to the appeals of some of these GCC countries, particularly uh, Saudi Arabia, to give them rather sophisticated weaponry, defensive, to protect their shores against the madman Khomeini who sends attacks into their, into their shores. Do you remember a while back when the Saudis shot down an uh, Iranian fighter? That did a lot, because a lot of people said, hey, the Saudis are all talk and they won't do anything to defend their own interests. But they, they were, their airspace was, was uh, attacked, really. A plane came into their airspace, and the Saudis went out and shot it down. That was, I think, the last time that's happened, and therefore, I think people see that a Saudi Arabia, backed with defensive I'm thinking of AWACS in this case, you know, that reaches out with this sophisticated radar and can tell an awful lot about when attacks are coming, backed by our sophisticated technology, really are determined to help themselves keep the Gulf open. You were right about Iran. You, you, I, I'm not sure I would add to your predicate, though, that Iraq hasn't been overly friendly with the United States. And Iran, the mullahs there, the Khomeini and these, Rafsanjani and these other people are, are really difficult to deal with. Particularly, they still see our country as the devil. They still look at, and that's the word they use, they still see us as, as the devil and the source of all evil. And the Iran-Iraq war, let me, I don't want to get diverted because I think I've answered your question, but the Iran-Iraq war is ghastly. You have, you have 12 year old kids being sent into battle with a little message around their neck the, being convinced and brainwashed into that if they just lose their life, they go right straight to, to meet the Lord, meet Allah. And, and the death, the carnage of young lives, that level, kids going in there or getting mustard gassed in the, 
in the exchange between them is awful. The human life that's lost in that war that really doesn't concern us seems, seems to be of little concern to people is awful. And yet there is no clear answer to how that war is going to turn out. The worst thing that could happen out of that war, and I don't know whether you're studying the history of that part of the war, would be to destabilize the Persian Gulf, to have that radical fanaticism of Khomeini spread through these Gulf countries. If that ever happened, the interests of the, of the uh, uh, Western world would just be really dashed to the ground. So that would clearly not be in the interest of the United States or our allies, but fortunately it looks like the Gulf Cooperative Council there, the GCC countries that I clicked off for you, not all of them, but the, some of them, uh, are, are willing to defend their own interest. And I hope that's the way this will be resolved. And I hope there will be some negotiation between them to end the carnage. This is a situation where the United States does not have much leverage, though, because of the hostage thing years ago with Iran, the failure to support the Shah, the, the loss of, you know, this terrible radicalism that that came in into following on the Shah, much more oppressive than anything the Shah did. Women taken out and driven back into the, out of the bazaars, all forced to wear these, wear these, uh, take off the Western stuff and go with the veils. And they really have set education, set way back. And so Iran is in terrible shape right now. But we're hoping that there can be some resolution to the war, but it's only gonna be a negotiation between the parties. And right now it doesn't look very encouraging. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any others? Here we go. Hello, my name is Alan Foster. Mr. Vice President, what is your response to the fact that the national deficit has increased more during this administration than any other administration? My response is I don't like that, and I think we ought to do something about it. And uh, we believe that the way you get it down is to continue economic growth, to cut spending, and we've sent a lot of spending cuts up to the Hill that have not been approved, and to streamline the government. They've had, I don't know if you've read about the Grace Commission that has come up with some recommendations that would increase, increase efficiency and reduce expense and increase the, the, uh, the uh, lower the deficit. But also we think we need a couple of tools to do this that would discipline not just the Congress. And you got to remember, Congress appropriates every single dime. The President doesn't appropriate a nickel in terms of spending. We send recommendations, but the spending comes from the United States Congress, and the American people in the most recent surveys blame the Congress more than the administration for, for the deficits. Having said that, they are bad. We've got to get them down. We want to see a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. Many states have that. I don't know if Kentucky's got it or not, and that means that they have to balance their budget, and that means more cooperation is forced between the legislative and the executive branch. In addition, there's a thing called the line item veto. Today, for a president to turn down a spending bill, he has to turn down the whole thing. But in many states, they have a thing called line item veto, and a president can look down and say, hey, this level of spending is too high for this dam or for this air base or for this you know, program, whatever it is. So we want the line item veto for the president. And if the Congress continues to be less responsive in terms of spending, we believe that line item veto would give the president what many governors have and would get spending on down. So the deficit remains a problem. Fortunately, it hasn't resulted in some of the dire things that many people said, you know, great increases in inflation or the economy stalling out or something of that nature. But still, it's a problem. And we are concerned about them. And I think that it's a, it's a problem that has to be addressed not just by the executive branch or just by the Congress, but working cooperatively in, term, in a bipartisan way. Social Security was saved under our president, under this president, but it was saved because we had a bipartisan commission that went in and said, hey, it's not fair to the older people to be, have an actuarially unsound Social Security system. So they got together, bipartisan, said, let's lay partisanship aside and worked out an agreement. The same thing has to be done, in my view, on getting these, these deficits down. And let's hope after the election it will. One more. Who wants the last shot? Last question. Here she is. Mr. Vice President, my name is Shelley Lovato, and this is a two-part question. If the United States has to go to war, how do you think we would compare it to the Soviet Union and the strategic nuclear power? In what, way, in what areas 
Are we superior? In what areas do we need improvement? Okay, that's a very technical question and a good one, but let me just argue with the predicate because I don't want to put it in the terms, it's very sensitive, I don't want to put it in the terms if we have to go to war. I am convinced, and I say this as one who prepared all the intelligence estimates for this country for one year when I headed the entire intelligence community, as one who's been the United Nations ambassador and thus dealt with many other countries, uh, as one who understands the China equation because I was ambassador over there, and now vice president with, with some experience in dealing with foreign countries. I really believe what I said up here, that I don't think there is a danger of going to, going to war. I just don't believe it. I think we are closer to peace than before we came in. I don't put that in a political contest, but I really think, and it gets to your question though, because I think we have redressed what in many areas was a clear imbalance. Where we are superior is technologically, and that's a broad statement, but it used to be missile accuracy, and this gets into highly uh, complicated things. But it's a very important thing. Regrettably, the Soviets have been catching up dramatically on that. We still retain a high technology edge in a lot of areas. I think of uh, submarine, sophisticated submarine technology. We're ahead of them in there. Where they are ahead of us is in numbers, mass megatonnage. SS-18 that is a, makes a bigger bang than anything we've got, or the numbers of deployed weapons. Take Europe today. This is the old system, you know, they, you ask me what time it is and I'm telling you how to build a watch here, but it's a very interesting subject. In Europe, for example, one of the things that we fought for uh, was the alliance to stay together when the Soviets had, and this is a rough figure, 1,200 intermediate nuclear force warheads and the alliance had zero. There was monopoly for the Soviets. That was in terms of deployed, rapid, you know, short warning time weapons. Now, that's changed now because the Alliance said this, we want to get rid of all these weapons, U.S. taking the lead. If you don't want to join us, why, we'll have to deploy and let's work for equal numbers. So an area that they're ahead in this nuclear deployment right now is in terms of intermediate nuclear forces in Europe. They got close to 1,200 and probably well, in that range, 1,200 warheads, and I, we don't, you know, we're just beginning to deploy Pershing twos. But what we really want to do is get rid of them all. But we just can't let them sit there with, with a nuclear monopoly. So those are some of the areas. There are many others, too. Some of our airplane technology, you know, our, our manned airplane technology is still better. This B-1 will be more advanced than, than anything they've got when it comes out. There's other things on the drawing board. You've read the tip of the iceberg on stealth, the, new weapon system that, that is very advanced. So our, adva our thing, and this gets right down to what you all are doing in school, the thing where we are superior to them in is technology, know-how, ability to make things happen. It's true not just in weapons, it's true in agriculture production, it's true in a lot of other things, it's true in production of our goods and services. We are advanced over the Soviet Union and they try to steal the technology, they try to get it any way they can, but we're superior to them in that. Where they have it over us is that they can take through their closed society. They don't have congressmen. They don't have debates and you know, questions and answers in Paducah High School. They don't have a, the give and take that comes from the Congress balancing off against the executive branch. They have a closed society. And up till now in history, and maybe it'll continue, They've been able to take whatever percentage of their gross national product they want and put it off into military weapons. Now, you can't do that in this country. The voter wouldn't permit that. But whatever it is that they think they needed, they've been able to do that. Now they've got some economic problems, and maybe that, maybe that thesis should be challenged. But we are not, in, because of our technology and our innovativeness and this kind of spirit of our country, uh, I, I don't think we have anything to worry about right now as long as we keep our country strong. And last point, we got an ABM treaty, when they anti-ballistic missile treaty, when they thought we were going to deploy an ABM system. I am convinced that if we stay on the track of a strong defense, high technology, keeping our edge in research or whatever it is, on whatever it is, uh, that we will get the kind of arms reductions that this country is crying out for. Good question, too long an answer, but in any event, thank all of you very, very much for having me here. Appreciate it. Thank you.